shut up, that you're going to be embarrassed. And I even hear them flat out saying, I'm telling you what to do as a pastor. Give me a chance and I'll give you what does the Bible say. Always ask for what does the Bible say. Get it right here on Star News. New time, Thursday nights at 9 o'clock. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? If you want to find people who are studying God's Word, come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 the Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, watch A Word from the Lord Thursday nights at 9 o'clock right here on WGSR. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you. Glad you are, are, are with us tonight. We've been kind of out of pocket for a couple weeks, and I uh, hope you've been enjoying the, the uh, lessons from the, the tent meeting, if you missed it. Those, uh, those tent meeting DVDs are available. If you'll simply email me and let me know that you'd like a copy of them, we'll be glad to get one of those out to you. Uh, here's our content information. 250 the Boulevard, uh, there in Eden, 276-340-2653. That's the best number to get me right there. 276-340-2653. Our word from the Lord at gmail.com, of course, is, our <clears throat> is my email address. And if you are in the area, 823 Starling Avenue in Martinsville, if you'd like to worship with the saints there, uh, 120 American Legion in, uh, in Danville. That's uh, where Mark is. And uh, I know that the, the brethren there on either of these places would be glad to see you if you're in the area to worship with them on Sundays uh, at 10 and 11. Uh, every one of these places in Eden, Martinsville, and Danville, you can assemble with the saints there. Uh, Tuesday nights in Danville, Wednesday nights in Martinsville, Thursday nights in Eden. And uh, we'd be glad for you to Come out and study the Bible with us. Also, we want to remind you Religious Review coming up tonight after the news. So <clears throat> we really do try to make ourselves available to you to study God's Word with you. And we hope that you will uh, take advantage of that very thing. Tonight, we're going to be dealing with some things from the mailbag. You know, viewers ask us questions sometimes, and sometimes we get letters. And I have a, have a, a letter here that was sent to us. And I've, I've actually... Um, uh, answered th this gentleman before. He's pretty uh, uh, insistent that we owe him a thousand dollars. And I'm just telling you, Mr. Hopkins, uh, I don't owe you one red dime. You haven't uh, fulfilled the claim. The claim was show us in the Bible where you're saved at the point of faith only. You know, that's the thing. Saved by faith only. And uh, here's the last paragraph that you write in this letter. Uh, I'm going to see if I can pull it up for us all to read. And you tell me, we'll let the, we'll let the uh, uh, viewing audience decide whether you have actually done what we uh, said in order to get the, the $1,000. Now, our claim or our challenge is to find where someone is saved at the point of faith. Now, here is Mr. Hopkins' uh, letter. And I'm going to see if I can get it up here where we can uh, read it together. Here's what he says. Let me go over here. His last paragraph. I think that would be the wrong, that's the wrong letter we have here. Here it is. Uh, here it is. Please send me the $1,000, right right here. Please send me the $1,000 you offer as a challenge to anyone who can prove that we have an inward faith before we are baptized. Now, friends, if you ever heard us say that a person never has faith before they're baptized, then you're not listening. You need to get some Q-tips. We would never say a person is baptized before they had an inward faith. Hebrews 11.6 says <laughs> that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
So we would never say that you are to be baptized before you have faith. Why would you do anything before you have faith? So, Mr. Hopkins, you need to listen. We never said find a scripture that says you have an inward faith before you're baptized. I mean, how ridiculous is that? But what you misunderstand, Mr. Hopkins, is that you have to have more than just faith. You are not saved at the point of faith only. And so, that, that, I mean, that's, that's the challenge right there. Find the verse that says you're saved at the point of faith only. All right? So, no, you don't get the $1,000. And uh, I, I really like this, the last part. Let me just go ahead and put the last paragraph up here. This is the interesting part. It's what I thought was, uh, send me my $1,000. Send it to me. If I have to go to court, I will. Uh, I will get a lot more. Well, take me to court. That's all I can say. Take me to court. If you think that if you think that we owe you $1,000 because you haven't answered what we want to answer, then by all means take it to court. I'd be glad to defend this. I defend this in public, you know, every day. So right here we are every week on TV defending our challenge. So get all the records, you know, get, get all the, all the uh, lessons that we've done and see if we've ever said find where you're saved uh, before baptism you know, at the point of faith, just find that where we say we'll give you a thousand dollars, or excuse me, find where you say we'll give you a thousand dollars if you can find where you have an inward faith before baptism. Never said that. Never said that. So we get letters, you know, all the time. We get letters of this uh, nature all the time. You might say of of individuals trying to claim this uh, this challenge. Okay are trying to claim the, the reward. But the problem is they haven't done what we said. That's not, that's not the challenge. The challenge is not finding where you have faith before baptism. We would say that. But here's what Mr. Hopkins gets down to. He says water salvation is a lie. Water baptism, now this is his quote, water baptism does not save anyone. You misunderstand the Bible. The eunuch was saved before he was baptized. Now, that's what he's going to to prove. But to say that water baptism is a lie or that we don't understand the scriptures when we say that a person must be baptized for the remission of sins is to misunderstand the scriptures. That's That's what you misunderstand. To say that a person is saved before baptism That's where you misunderstand the scriptures. And a matter of fact, notice what Mr. Hopkins says uh, later on the leather. He says, another thing I'm confused about is the body of Christ. Well, if, if this is another thing he's confused about, then he must be admitting that he's confused about baptism. And that's obvious. He is. So... So he's really confused about baptism, and he's really the one who doesn't understand the Bible. He admits it. He said, I'm confused about another thing. Okay, well, maybe we can help you with that. But see, here's the thing, and I just want to say this because I know there are many people who probably like Mr. Hopkins who are out there. The reason why Mr. Hopkins keeps writing and the reason why he keeps sending these two-page letters is because really the truth is getting to him. Really there's something that we're saying that's actually working on him that he knows deep down inside we're really telling the truth and he's fighting against it. He's fighting against it. He's kicking, he's kicking and fighting against it because he does not want to let go of the error and accept the truth. So he fights against it. And that's fine. I just hope that you have time to uh, uh, obey the gospel, sir, before it's everlasting too late. <clears throat> but now... Here's what I want, to, I want to discuss. If water baptism is a lie, now friends, that's his word, water baptism. Uh, we never said water baptism saves. We understand that water baptism is just part of God's plan for salvation. It is the obedience. It is the obedience to God that actually saves. It's not just the water baptism itself. It's not just getting dunked in the water. 
If that were the case, then people would be saved all the time. Every summer they go out and jump in a swimming pool and they're baptized. They're immersed. That's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is that baptism is a part of God's plan and you must be obedient to all of God's plan in order to receive the blessing that God put on the other side of baptism. Now, that's really where we are. So, what we're dealing with tonight is baptism. Now, here is what I want you to consider. Here is a text from Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, and we're going to deal with some more of this text. But notice what Paul says. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, from this text, I want you to notice some things. If baptism is not essential, if it's not important to salvation, if it's not important to salvation, then it must be that some things follow. No, it logically follow. If baptism is not important, there's some earbuds in my bag there. If baptism is not important, then there are, must be some other things that are not important. Because look what Paul says. Paul says that baptism is connected with the death of Christ. So, if baptism is not important, then the death of Christ is not important. Now, don't go quoting me like, like uh, uh, the gentleman who made the funny faces said, the crybaby said. Don't go around saying that I said the death of Christ is not important. That's not what I said. I said if, if baptism is not important. If baptism is not important, then the death of Christ is not important. Because look what Paul says. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized to his death? Was his death unimportant? No one is going to say that the death of Christ was unimportant who professes to be a Christian. Notice this. His death was very important. If you believe that his death was important, then you have to then conclude that baptism is important because Paul says we're buried with him, uh, we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. So baptism is connected with his death. Is his death important? Yes. How important is it? In 1 John 2, 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, notice what Paul says. 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. Uh, I'm sorry. First John. First John 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now watch it. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So, Jesus was the propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, not just for the Christians, but also for the sins of the whole world. In other words, he became the sacrifice through which all men could obtain salvation. Not that they would, but that they could. It was possible for them. Notice John 3, verse 16. John 3, 16. Most people don't read this correctly, but notice this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All right, should not perish. Doesn't mean would not. Doesn't mean could not. But it should not perish. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent, his son, um, sent not his Son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him uh, might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not, uh, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, it is not the case that Christ's death is unimportant. 
It's obvious important. It is through him, <clears throat> through his sacrifice, through his death, that we actually have the hope of eternal life. So we're not saying that his death is not important. It obviously is important uh, because it is the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Now watch this. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4, listen to what Paul says. Galatians 1 and verse 4, Paul says that Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. He gave himself to be a deliverer, to deliver us from this evil world. So, so many verses we could bring up and illustrate that Christ's death is important. And my point to this, friends, is simply this. If his death was important, then baptism must be important because Paul said we're baptized into his death. But to say that baptism is not important and that his death is important is to really do harm to the scripture. It's to really to be dishonest with the scripture. Because one is connected to the other. Now notice this. In Matthew 20, and verse 28, Jesus said, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now that's important. His life was a ransom. His death. He laid down his life so that we might have a ransom, that we might uh, have the forgiveness of sin. First Timothy, sorry about that. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse uh, 5. Notice what Paul says. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He gave himself as the ransom. He paid the price. He shed his blood. His death is important. His death is important. And if his death is important, then so must be baptism, which Paul says, puts us into Christ. Do I need to go on to show the importance of Christ's death? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, it is in his death that he actually uh, uh, pays the price for our sins, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, paid the price to, to uh, heal the sins of, our, of us, to cover our wounds, to heal our, to heal our wounds, our sinful wounds, through his blood. Now, if baptism is where you enter into the death with Christ, and Paul says it is, then it must be important. Because it's connected to Christ. How, friends, are you going to die with Christ if you are not baptized with him? Now, Mr. Hopkins, you'll say, well, the eunuch was saved before he was baptized. If that's the case, then the eunuch was saved before he ever died with Christ. He was saved before he ever died with Christ. Died to sin with, with Christ. Now, if you think, if you want to stand before God with that idea, then that's fine. You go ahead. But I'm not going to. I'm not going to, to uh, totally abuse the Scripture and refuse to accept what God clearly shows is the connection between the death of Christ and baptism. You may reject baptism, but if you do, you're going to have to reject the death of Christ. And notice this. Paul says in Romans 6 verse 5, he says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. The only way you're going to overcome sin is if you overcome it the way Christ took care of it. Christ took our sins and died with it so that we too could have a way to overcome sin. And that's Romans chapter 6. Listen to this. In Romans chapter 6, let's come on down. I may be getting a little ahead of myself. But notice what Paul says in verse, uh, let's see, verse uh, 6 here. He says, um, uh, we plan to get in the likeness of his death. Notice this, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should uh, not serve sin. 
For he that is dead is free from sin. Well, the only way you're going to die and be freed from sin is if you die with Christ. Christ is the one who freed us from sin. Verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, how are you, die, how did, how are you dead with Christ? How did you die with Christ? In baptism is what Paul said. Is his death important? That's where you die with Christ. Now, if we be dead with Christ, Mr. Hopkins, you're not dead with Christ. You haven't died with Christ because you said baptism is not essential, yet you're saved before you were ever baptized. Well, if that's the case, if that's the case, then Paul must have not known what he's talking about. All right? Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death had no more dominion over him, for he that died... Now watch it. Here it is. Verse 10. For in, he, in that he died, he died unto sin once. But that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourself to be uh, dead indeed unto sin. Why? Because you died with Christ. Now, if, if, the, if baptism is not essential, if it's not important, then you have to say that the, that the death of Christ is not important. Paul puts them together. So what goes, what goes with the death of Christ must be just as important as the death of Christ. See that? Paul said you're planted in, together in the likeness of his death. Mr. Hopkins and some others, many others out there said, no, no, I'm going to die to sin. I'm going to die to sin. I'm going to be uh, uh, raised again. I'm going to live free from sin, and then I'm going to be buried. Well, now you've got a problem. So if his death is important, then baptism must be important because they go hand in hand. That's what Paul said. <clears throat> now, here it is. If baptism is not important, if baptism is not important, here's the number two. If baptism is not important, then the burial of Christ must not be important. Now, now stay with me, friends. Notice this. All through Romans 6, Paul is showing a connection between baptism and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, most people want to say, well, Romans 15, Romans 15, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 15 is, is the gospel. Paul said, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein you stand. <clears throat> Come on down to verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. There's his death. And that he uh, uh, was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, that's the gospel. Now, if that's the case, if that's the case, then the things that Paul puts with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ show that they're important as well. Now, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Now, the death of Christ is important. And Paul says, that's where you die with Christ, in the waters of baptism. And then he says, and we're buried with him by baptism into death. Now, was his death important? Was the, was the, was the death of Christ important? I mean, the burial of Christ important? It certainly was. Notice this. It was so important that the prophets prophesied where he would be buried. They prophesied about his burial. In Isaiah 53 and verse 9, Isaiah 53 and verse 9. Notice what Isaiah says. He made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Now that's Isaiah prophesying about Christ. And sure enough, Christ was buried with the rich. Joseph of Arimathea laid him in a grave wherein no man had ever been laid. He died with the wicked. He hung on the cross between the two malefactors. And here he is being prophesied about, and his, in his burial, his burial is specifically pointed out that would be with the rich. And so here it is being prophesied. Is his burial important? Yes. Yeah, it, yes, it was. As a matter of fact, it was in his burial that it was verified that he was dead. See that? Now, the soldiers, we know the soldiers came by and they didn't break his legs. All right? Didn't break his legs. Now, now, the, uh, the, the Muslims say, well, you know, they didn't break his legs. So he wasn't really dead. He just swooned on the cross. Supposedly, they crucified him. No. Look at this. The Jews knew he was dead. They knew he was dead. 
to the point that they wanted to make sure that his burial was not tampered with so that people could say he, uh, uh, he was risen again. Notice this in Matthew 27. Matthew 27 uh, and verse, we'll start in verse 62. Look at this. I'm sorry. Get that verse in there. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that this deceiver said while he was yet alive, now they said he was dead. His enemies said he was dead. The people who are closest to the cross said he was dead. This deceiver said while he was yet alive, so they, they, they thought he was dead. They accepted the fact that he was dead. They said, he said, after three days I'll rise again. Command therefore, now watch this, command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people that he has risen from the dead so that the last error shall be worse than the first. They said, we want to make sure that he stays in that grave at least three days so that no one can say that he's really risen by stealing his body. His, his enemies thought he was dead. Pilate thought he was dead. <clears throat> Pilate accepted the fact unto them that he was dead. And the guards accepted the fact that he was dead. So all the people surrounding Christ's death, the Roman soldiers... Pilate, his enemies, the Jews, they said he was dead. His burial helped prove or helped verify that he was dead. Notice this. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. They made sure that the sepulchre was sealed. They made sure that no one was going to tamper with it because they knew he was dead, but they didn't want someone still in the body. Now, that's the burial of Christ. Now, was it important? It was important enough to his enemies because they wanted to verify that he was dead. And so the way you verify he's dead, what you bury him, you seal him, and you make sure that, he's, that he stays in the grave. Now, friends, if the burial of Christ is important, and it is. Then baptism must be important too. Because look what Paul does. Paul says. Paul says it's connected with it. It's connected with it. Look again. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse, uh, uh, verse 4. He said, That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of uh, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Buried by baptism into death. Must be important. Must be important. Paul said in Colossians 2 verse 12. And just hold on for a second folks. We're going to put the phone lines up in just a minute. Colossians 2 12. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him. Through the faith of the operation of God. Who hath raised him from the dead. Buried with him in baptism. Friends. Uh, uh, baptism is a burial. It's an immersion. It means submerged. It means covered, completely covered. Friends, dead people are the ones who are buried. You bury dead people. Now think with me, Mr. Hopkins. If you were alive in Christ, that is your sins were forgiven, you were made alive, spiritually alive in Christ, before you were baptized, and then you were baptized, you're burying a dead person. You're burying someone alive. Is that really, what, is that really the, the, the figure that you do? Is that really what you do? Let me tell you, I hope you never go into the funeral business. You go to the Hopkins funeral home, uh, Ernest Hopkins funeral home, he'll bury you alive. Oh, no. No, I want to make sure I'm dead before I'm buried. I had a teacher in school that knew the, uh, the mortician that embalmed Elvis. And everybody's saying, well, Elvis is alive, Elvis is alive. 
My teacher said, I just asked my neighbor. said, is Elvis dead? He said, well, if he's not, he sure is mad. Yeah, he's dead. He's dead. You bury dead people. Romans 6 and verse 6, look what Paul says. Uh, Romans 6, 6. Paul says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we shall not serve sin. You die with him. You crucify. You're dead to sin. And so you bury the dead person. You're buried with him in baptism. Now, friends, if baptism is not important, if baptism is not essential, if baptism is not significant when it comes to salvation, then the death and burial of Christ must not be significant either. Because Paul puts them together. Now, you can't have one without the other. You can't have one without the other. If one's important, then they're both important. All right, Scott, let's go ahead and put the phone lines up. I'm going to take this call. You're on the word of the Lord. Hello. 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 <clears throat> yeah. I've... Turn your turn your TV down a little bit. Uh, I think you're doing an excellent job. I and appreciate it. I wanted to tell you that and the preacher before you, and there was a baby born last week on channel eight or eleven. Had four bottom teeth. Okay. And I wanted to tell him that he didn't. Right. I never heard of one. Okay. You can check with channel twelve or channel eleven and get the same thing. They showed the baby. Okay. That had four bottom teeth. Okay. But it couldn't talk or sin. Right. Right. Okay. Get your program. Right. And thank you. All right. Appreciate your call. All right. Yeah, it's just not, I mean, I know there's some cases where people are, or babies are born with teeth, but that's generally not the rule, number one. Number two, the, the, uh, uh, the, the psalm there, Psalm 58, says that they speak lies, they go astray speaking lies the minute they're born. Well, I, like the man said, they might have teeth, but they didn't start talking. Now, the man that called in at the end of the program, talking to Mark, said he knew a baby who was speaking lies uh, uh, before he could talk. Now, go figure that one out. Speaking lies before he could talk. How'd he know? How'd he know he could speak lies? How'd he know what that baby's saying? Baby's crying. Baby's crying. Oh, he's lying. I think that baby wants some food. No, he's lying. He's lying. Don't feed him. I think that baby's got a dirty diaper. No, he's lying. He's just crying over there. He's just lying. All right, well, that, that's kind of Sudden as you get when you don't agree with the Bible, it's kind of like the letter that we're dealing with here. Now, friends, if one is true, then the other is true. If one's important, the other is important. If baptism is not essential, then the, the death and burial of Christ is not essential either. You on the word of the Lord? Hey, brother. Hey. Um, I, I've talked to you before, been in church with you, and uh, we corresponded back and forth letters. I was a guy that called the last one. Uh, I, I sat and watched a, a little ba uh, baby boy, and he done something wrong. He knew it was wrong. He tried to hide it. His daddy seen what was done. He said, he said, uh, son, did you do that? He shook his head, no, I didn't do it. He lied before he could even speak. That's what I was getting at. But sir, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Just because he doesn't want to get caught, I mean, he I, he understood he was in trouble. Yeah. But does that mean that he's going to, if he if that child was to die, you said he lied. But if that child died, would he go to hell? No, sir. All right. So then, so then, why would you say that you're born in sin? Because sin is going to send you to hell. That's exactly right. But the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the grace of God covers a person. Uh, until uh, that they make a willful decision to sin. Okay, so here's the thing then. Why, why not just say that that's the case instead of saying they're born in sin, but now let's make an exception to the rule and God's going to cover it. Why not just say that they're not sinners until the day that they make the willful choice to disobey God? 
Okay. Wouldn't that be because, easier than, uh, than making have, up a false doctrine like they're born in sin? We have to go back to what the Bible says, and, and it says that uh, mischief is bound in the heart of a child, but the <coughs> rod of correction will drive him drive it far from him. Well. Uh, and then it says bring a child up in the way he should go. And okay. And he's old, he'll not depart from it. But does that mean that he's a sinner when he's born? That's really what we're getting down to. He has he has the nature to the the propensity to sin. Well, now that's that's different than saying that he's he's a he's born in sin. No, uh, yeah, I've always because here, here's uh, the thing. Here's the thing. The, a, a child. A, go ahead. A child. A child when he's born cries because that's what he knows. That's how he knows to get attention. All right. Great. He can't talk. He can't say what's wrong. And so he cries. If his tummy's hurt, he cries. We need a diaper change, he cries. And he knows that if I cry, someone responds. So basically, he's just being conditioned that if I want something, you know, then I cry. So in other words, he's, he's being uh, conditioned to act in such a way that he wants to get what he wants. But that doesn't make him a sinner if he wants some candy and mama says, no, don't get candy, and he goes and gets it anyway. He's just used to getting what he wants. So, but it's not a sin. That's a thing. My, my, ch my children know, my children know that they're supposed to wear their seatbelts when they're in the car. But if the policeman stops me and my child does not have their seatbelt on, who's going to get the ticket? You are. Well, well the ch my, my child's breaking the law, not me. I got my seatbelt on. It, that's a good example of... Uh the grace of God covering the child uh, before he makes a conscious decision. You, how about how about it's a good illustration of a child not being accountable for his actions uh, until a certain age? It's not a sin. Yeah. I say it's not a sin. If it was a sin, sir, then that child has to do what God says in order to remove those sins. Uh, let what? me let me give you uh, some scripture. Uh, uh, this is uh, when. Uh, David's child by Bathsheba was uh, was dying, and David was fasting and praying, and uh, he was trying uh, to uh, appeal to the Lord to uh, touch and heal the son, uh, his son. And uh, they were all amazed when he uh, when the son died. That David quit, got up, and washed, cleaned up, right. fresh, clean clothes on, and they couldn't believe it. And he said, "Well, I can't, I can't bring him back, but right. I can go to be with him." So if David was a man after God's own heart, and he he uh, he was going to heaven, that means the child was going to heaven. Uh, had the child ever committed wrong? I'm sure he had. But, no. Uh, the grace of God covered. Not, what, now, what, now, sir, why would you say the child committed wrong? See, that's my point. You're trying to justify a doctrine, but you, the easier thing would do is to drop the born in sin and just say the child has not sinned. God's not going to hold anything accountable to this child until they make a willful decision, until they make a conscious effort to say, you know what, I'm going to serve the devil instead of the Lord. But instead, you have a doctrine that says a child's born in sin, and if they die, then they have to go to hell. But God's a merciful God, so he's not going to send them to hell. Well, instead of making up all that doctrine, why not just stick with the truth? The truth is a child is not held accountable for the things that you call a sin, because they're, because they're not sinning. Knowingly. They're not, but I'm saying it's not sinning. Don't say it's a sin. Just say they're not held accountable for it. Say so instead of saying they're born in sin. You can use semantics with the word. Well, but I'm saying that's what you're doing. But when you do that, you're actually making a doctrine that's not in the Bible. See? The Bible says clearly. Mischief is bound up in the heart of a child. Now what? Okay. Bound up? Okay. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that they're born sinners. Yes, it does. No, sir. If if they're born sinners, if they're born sinners and they die, then God's justice has to send them to hell. Uh, a baby comes out of the womb. A baby comes out of the womb, and ten seconds after it's out of the womb, it dies. Now, is it going to heaven or is it going to hell? It's going to heaven. But it's born in sin, according to you. Uh, let me, let me say this. But it's born in sin, according to you, sir. That's, that's my point. If you look at it from a Calvinistic standpoint, he's going to hell. That, but well, that's what you're it, teaching, though, sir. 
from an Armenian standpoint, he's going to heaven. How about looking at it from a biblical standpoint? He's going to, he's not, he's not doing, hadn't done anything wrong. Well, from from my from my interp from my understanding of the scriptures, uh, he is going to heaven by the grace of God. Okay, but here's but here's my understanding of scripture: is he's going to heaven if he dies, not because God has forgiven all these sins, but because he has not sinned to start with. Here's Romans nine eleven: for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. Now, has a child done any evil before they're born? Not before he's born. When he comes out of the womb, what did he do wrong? Uh, the Bible says he comes forth lying. Now, sir, that the other do you not understand the do you not understand the figure of speech from from uh, uh, Psalm fifty eight? There, he comes forth. He goes astray. Now, your doctrine says that he was astray in the womb. Uh, that's correct. But the, uh, that's not what the Bible says. All right. Is, is this, is this, is Paul right when he says children being not yet born, neither having done good or evil? Who, who installs, I'm asking you a question. If you'll answer this for the, for the listening audience, you'll help people tonight, Mr. Oilfield. All right. If you'll answer mine, then I'll answer yours. If, if, uh, if the mischief, the, the, the nature to do wrong, is bound up in the heart of a child, who bounds it up? Who puts it in there? So, How did it get in there? I, I just answered that earlier. I said a child is conditioned to be selfish in the sense of when he cries, he gets something. And so that is, that is he's conditioned that way. But that does not mean he sinned. He, now, now, you answer mine. You said a child comes out of the womb lying. Now, if he's in the womb, Paul said, in the womb, he's neither done good or evil. Now, is he a sinner in the womb or not? He, he has committed no evil, but he is, uh, he's condemned already according to the Scriptures. Sir, all right. But, I, but, if, but I, if he dies when he comes out of the womb, you're saying he's going to heaven. Until he consciously sins. Sir, now, when he consciously sins, you said he's a sinner. Consciously or not consciously, you said he's a sinner. A sinner means he's habitually committing sin. Well, you said he's a sinner. You said he's in the womb, habitually committing sin. You said he was a sinner. No, sir. I said he was, he's bound with sin already in him. He well, has, sir, now, what, now you talk about semantics. If you're bound with sin already in him, is he a sinner? That's right. And what's in you is going to come out. Sir... So, so you're saying a child is a sinner in the womb? He, he is bound up with sin. That's the reason he comes out. You don't have to teach him to steal. You don't have to sir, teach him to do wrong. Sir. You don't have to teach him to, to cuss. And If they hear it, they, they, they don't, you have to really teach a child to quote Scripture. But they, if, they hear, if they hear something, uh, a, a naughty word, they'll pick it up easy. Sir, here, here, here's what the oh. Bible says. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth off of the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. What law has a child in the womb committed, transgressed, in order to be a sinner? He's condemned already. What sin has he committed? No, I ain't talking about the what, sin. You said he's a sinner. He's condemned. You, no, he's not. You said if he comes out of the womb and dies, he's going to go to heaven. So that's not condemned. He's condemned. Sir, you can't say he's condemned, and then when he comes out of the womb and dies, that he's going to heaven. You can't have it both ways. Either he's condemned or he's not condemned. Which is it? You got to read it all, brother. Sir, which is it? You can't have it both ways. Is he condemned? Is he a sinner in the womb? What you're doing, brother, is pen knife in the word. No, sir. I'm I'm pen knife in your doctrine. What is he a sinner in the womb? You have to compare. Is he a sinner in the womb? Scripture. Is he a sinner in the womb? No, he's condemned in the womb. But if he comes out, he's going to heaven. As long as he's under the grace of God. Sir, why don't you just say that he's under the grace of God in the womb then? He is. 
then how is he condemned? That's right. It, if a okay. man comes before th th judge, Thanks for your call. Thanks for your call. Well, folks, you see what happens when you try to defend false doctrine? We went round and round with this guy. He's condemned in the womb, he says. He says he's condemned in the womb, but he's covered by the grace of God. He's a sinner in the womb, but if he comes out and dies, guess what? He's going to heaven because he's covered by the grace of God. Well, why don't you just say he's covered by the grace of God to start with and forget all this condemning stuff? Forevermore. All right. <clears throat> now, we're going to... I don't know what line that was. You on the word from the Lord? Uh, hello, is James? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, James. I've met you once before, and I must say I, mu I do enjoy your show. Um, can I ask you, are you non-denominational? Well... You might say that. We're actually, what, what we are, ma'am, we're members of the church you read about in the Bible. Now, let me, let me explain that. There's only one kind of church in the Bible. And we are members of that church. Okay. Did, 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 that, did that help um, you? So I, you, you really don't, so you think any other denomination rather than your uh, non-denomination is uh, are, are, are not properly worshiping. Is, I'm, I'm saying I'm saying, saying right. there's the Bible talks about one kind of church, and so if you want to be pleasing to God, you have to be a part of that one kind of church. Now, let me let me ask, let me just kind of use the illustration here. If I said you need to go to the store. You would probably ask me, which store do I need to go to? But if, okay. right? I mean, because there's, there's Walmart, there's Kmart, there's Food Line, there's, you know, Aldi's, there's Save-A-Lot, whatever. There's all kinds of stores. But if there was only one kind of store, it wouldn't have a name. It would just be the store, right? If we lived in a town, there was only one store in town. And when I was growing up, there was only one store in the town where I live. And we said, if I'm going to the store, everybody knew what store you was going to because there was only one in town. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're saying about the Bible. There's only one kind of church in the Bible. And so we're saying everybody needs to be a member of that kind of church. Now, the Baptist is a different kind of church than the Methodist church. Would you agree with that? I can't say that because I don't know both of those. Well, I'm saying just just by just by their name. Do you know they're different, right? Okay, by their name, right? I can say that. But okay. still, in fact, they do um, they do get their teachings out of the King James version of the Bible. Whether okay. Most religions. Okay. Use that as their guide. All right. Now let's say this. I could say. I could say uh, Walmart and Foodline both carry uh, Heinz ketchup. Mm -hmm. Are they the same kind of store? They both have what you need, that Heinz ketchup. But, but are they the same kind of store? No. Okay. And that's my point. Just because someone might have something similar, something in common, that doesn't mean they're the same kind of store because they got different headquarters, right? They they have different items and so forth. Uh, so so they're not the same kind. Now, just because a certain kind of church may say, "Well, we preach on the King James," but that doesn't mean that their doctrine is in agreement with the with the Bible. Just like the gentleman that called earlier, he was you know he was twisting the scriptures all up trying to find. Born in sin, but it's not in there. But he was using the Bible. So the, the one kind of church looks a certain way. It, it, uh, uh, it worships a certain way. It teaches a certain thing. Uh, well, so, excuse me for my ignorance, because I really am trying to, you know, I what I understand is that uh, discernment is is a, a very much part of a, a Christian's life. You have to discern different um, preachings that you hear. To, and, but the but the true text is in the Bible, and and you have to discern 
in that manner what you will listen to and what you feel is, is true. Okay. I don't have a problem with that. And that's why... Now, go, go ahead. everyone's using the King James Ber Version, I I'm not sure which doctrine you're talking about. The doctrine is the written word. Okay. Well, let me give you an example. Or are you referring to something else well, when you I'm, say Well, I'm talking about how people say what the what the written word means. For example, here... here this Their interpretation. Okay, yeah. Now, let me give you an example. The Baptist would say you have to be immersed in order to be baptized correctly. Okay? And, and, that's, what, and, that's, what, and that's what baptism means. It means immersion. Now, the Methodist will come along, and they're going to say you can, be, you can have water sprinkled on you, or you can have water poured over you. Now, the word baptism means immersion. Mm -hmm. Now, you see what I'm saying? Well, Bo can both I give of them may be using the same Bible. That? Now, I was raised a Baptist. Okay. And uh, I can't say that I still claim Baptist because I don't currently attend a Baptist church. I do attend church. But my, my main interest is in the Bible study that's offered. I attend more Bible study uh, more regularly than I do Sunday services because it's the word and that I really want okay. to be f more familiar with. Well, well here's the thing. And go, go ahead. I'm, I'm running out of time, so I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, uh, well, I just wanted to say baptism, in my view, is it, it, not a requirement. You know, it's more like a symbolism that, you know, that it, it's like a symbolism, but it's okay. not a requirement. Okay. You know, now, it's, it's like but here, applying for a loan and putting down good faith okay. money. Okay. You but know, I, it, it's all right, not all right. a, well, I got a you. requirement, I got you. but it just shows something. Okay. But okay. I just want okay. Okay. But I, I got you. Now, but here's the thing. The Bible says, if the Bible says that it's more than just that, the question is, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be baptized the way the Bible says if it shows that basically what you've just said is wrong? That's what we're talking about. We're saying, let's take what you say, let's put it to the Bible, and let's see if what you're saying lines up with the Bible. Now, I've got one more point on baptism that I want to try to get to tonight, all right, from Romans 6. And so if you want to call back out of the program, I'd be glad to talk to you more, but I'd like to get this one, one point in there. Okay, well, thank you for your time, right. if you, I are, do if, love your show because it keeps me think, thinking. Okay. All right, well, I appreciate that. If you, you want to stay I, on the line, uh, we'll get your information, and I'll call you back. I would like to call you during okay. the show at another okay. time. Okay, I fair, will fair call enough. in again. Thanks fair again, enough. James. All right, thank you. All right, now. Uh, honest uh, individual, appreciate that. Now, now, here's another thing. So what we're saying, if baptism is not important, then Christ's death is not important and his burial is not important. Now, no one's going to say his death and burial are not important. But notice this, if baptism is not important, then his resurrection must not be important. Because look what Paul says. Paul says that if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. You cannot be resurrected with Christ if you have not been buried with Christ. Now notice this. Is the, resur or is the resurrection of Christ important? Yes. Notice this. Paul said, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Romans 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 16. For if the dead rise not... Then is not Christ raised, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Now, friends, if you look what Paul says about Christ being resurrected, if you haven't been dead with Christ, buried with Christ, and resurrected with Christ, you're still in your sins. So someone who tells me baptism is not important is basically telling me the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is not important because Paul puts them together. Paul puts them together. He says, for he that is dead is freed from sin. But you haven't died to sin because you haven't been buried with Christ. You haven't been crucified with Christ. You haven't been baptized into his death. You haven't been buried with him. So I know you haven't been risen with him. Paul says, now if you be dead with Christ, if you've been buried with him in baptism, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now, Folks, you may think you live with Christ, but you haven't died with him, you haven't been buried with him, and you haven't been resurrected with him. How can you believe that you're living with him? 
knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no more dominion over him. But you, you still going to die in your sins. If you don't obey Christ, you're going to die in your sins, all right? Romans 6, 10, For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, friends, you cannot say you died to sins and lived to God if you haven't died with Christ, been buried with Christ, and been resurrected with Christ. So, herein is the lesson. Romans 6, Paul said, you're, you're buried with Christ in baptism. All right, you die with Christ. You're baptized into his death. You're buried with him in baptism, and you're resurrected, you're raised with him from the grave wherein you were buried, just like Christ was. Now, don't tell me baptism is not important. Don't tell me baptism is not important when Paul puts them together. Now, friends, I know I'm running up time. I'm on, the, I'm on the, uh, the, the clock. I'm sure Scott is giving me the wrap-up. So let me just put, put this to you. If you'd like a copy of this program, all you have to do is write to me, call me, 276-340-2653. Come visit us at 250 the Boulevard. We'll be glad to study with you. Uh, I know they've got some phone the calls on the line. If you'll stay on the line, I'll talk to you out off the air. Thanks for watching. All you folks in Michigan, appreciate you watching. Appreciate our, the, the individual, the sister I met from uh, Livonia. I hope she's watching. Uh, and uh, uh, good to hear from you. But remember to ask, what does the Bible say? You'll always get a word from the Lord, and then you can do your own religious review. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Uh, some special guests, and we'll have that coming up for you in just a little bit. Right now, though, we jump into the news from across the region.